So, I was looking through my YouTube analytics the other day and discovered two things. One, not nearly enough of you are subscribed, and two, my audience male to female ratio is unacceptably masculine and would easily make my channel the lamest frat party on campus. Now, to solve this, I did some research on female dominated YouTube categories and found some topics like beauty, style, East Asian music. The last one aside, I think this explains why my recent videos have thankfully brought in more ladies. Now it's just about keeping this momentum going until I hit a 50 50 split. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about the wackiest ways people have tried to murder each other in military history. Again. Now, if you're anything like me, your interest in learning about creative strategies used in history is only surpassed by your disgust for the state of Missouri. Thinking they're hot stuff with their stupid bendy tube in the sky, they just drive by and say, Haha, look, it's like McDonald's, but half, before heading on to a better state. Well, luckily, you can both satisfy your itch for strategy and urge to level the state of Missouri in Conflict of Nations World War III. Conflict of Nations is a free online PvP strategy game where you get to pick a country to lead in a modern global warfare scenario. I played the the Battleground USA scenario where you get to play as a US state, and I was a big fan of the fact that in my first game playing as Illinois, I was perfectly positioned to send fighter jets to bring about the much deserved destruction of St. Louis. You can declare war on your neighbors, forge alliances, and choose your own strategy as you coordinate in battles of up to 128 players online. Don't have a computer handy? Not to worry! You can play on the same account across both your PC and your phone. Technology is crazy! So click the link in the description in the next 30 days to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. Big thanks to Conflict of Nations for sponsoring the video. Ancient Egypt cool place, right? I mean, how could you not love what's basically a Yu-Gi-Oh theme park? The ancient Egyptians were a quirky folk, known for practices like wrapping mummies and cherishing life. You know, things that have no place in today's world. The Egyptians saw life as a gift from the gods, and they loved all the lovely critters in the animal kingdom so much that they made them pets, made them mummies, made them cops, baboon police was a thing, look it up, but nothing quite compared to their love of cats. These furry felines were admired for their rodent-catching skills and their magical and divine connection to the cat goddess Bastet. This meant that cats and animals were a sacred cornerstone of ancient Egyptian culture, a culture that the Persian king Cambyses II was very well educated in. It's the 6th century BCE, and the Persians are looking at everything not Persia, noting the unacceptable lack of Persianness, which can only be fixed with the addition of yet more Persia, and next in line for their Persian conversion excursion was their cat-loving neighbors down south. Cambyses II took his Persian army to meet the young Egyptian pharaoh Samtek III at his fortified position at Pelusium, according to stratagems by... uh... <clears throat> Polyenus, the Egyptians were initially keeping the Persians at bay before Cambyses II decided to switch tactics. Our forces are stalled, sir. We're gonna need to do something if we want to gain the upper hand. Do not fret, Plebiscius, for I have studied the Nile folk and discovered a vital weakness. They shall cower in fear before the peril of my new ultimate weapon. Copernicus, bring forth the kitten trebuchet. Wait, trebuchet? Oh, we thought you said paper mache. What, so you didn't build my weapon or bring any cats? Oh no, we brought cats. We always bring cats. I think you missed a golden opportunity with catapults, sir. Shut the fuck up, grab the kittens. What? Grab the fucking kittens, Plebiscius. In one of the first recorded instances of psychological warfare, Cambyses II had his men paint the image of Bastet on the front of their shields and spread cats and other animals before their front lines. The Egyptian defense, upon seeing this display, refused to fight for fear of hurting the animals or striking the image of their goddess, resulting in the surrender of Pelusium. This left many Egyptians to be massacred as they retreated to Memphis, which would fall shortly after. Now, I bet you're probably thinking, that's dumb, they're just cats. How could that possibly undermine an entire defensive strategy? But keep in mind, these cats were the divine symbols of their gods, to be protected at all costs, else risk the eternal damnation of their soul. So, switch out cats with Zoe Kravitz's cat woman, and you get the idea. When you think of early submarine warfare, your mind probably wanders to the German U-boats that terrorized the high seas during the more than adequate war. But what if I told you that the first successful combat submarine was actually built from an old steam boiler by a bunch of southern boys in Alabama? I'm talking, of course, about the H.L. Hunley. Named after the lawyer-turned-Confederate marine engineer Horace Lawson Hunley, this adorable little fishboat was designed to fight for the South in the American Civil War. Now, many thought Hunley was motivated by good old Southern patriotism and protecting the basic human right to suppress other people's basic human rights, and normally that's a reasonable assumption to make of a Confederate. But in actuality, Hunley's driving force to build a submarine was much more noble. War money. 
You see, whichever lucky southern boy or girl was able to sink themselves, one Yankee float float would earn themselves a grand prize of up to $50,000 from Uncle Scooter, the equivalent of $1.3 million today. So Hunley and a group of engineers built and tested the hand-powered HL Hunley in Mobile, Alabama before it got shipped off to Charleston to deal with those Yanks and their pesky ironclads. The Confederacy began testing the Hunley in Charleston Bay with a crew unfamiliar with the controls, which is basically the same thing as asking a horse to babysit your newborn. The Hunley was preparing to depart on its first attack when there was an accident with the controls, causing it to sink with the hatch open at the dock, drowning five of its eight-man crew. But not to worry, a submarine can be drained and people are replaceable. The sub was recovered, cleared out of some junk, and was given good as new to Horace Hunley to take command before setting off on another test run, with a more experienced crew this time. Good luck on the test, Hunley. Haha, <laughs> don't worry, I invented this thing. <laughs> okay, you go get him. <laughs> I will, Charles. <laughs> okay, Clyde, get the crane ship. The Hunley sunk again, killing its creator and crew. But not to worry, a submarine can be drained and people are replaceable. The Hunley was recovered and finally set off on its first combat voyage targeting the USS Housatonic blockading Charleston. The Hunley was originally intended to tow a floating mine into its target, but this plan was labeled too dangerous as the rope could get tangled or the mine could drift into the submarine itself. So instead, they thought it'd be safer to go with a spar torpedo, which was essentially a bomb. Uh, attached to the end of a wooden stick. A spear, but with an aftertaste, if you will. The Hunley set off during the night, cranking its way towards its prey anchored five miles offshore. As the submarine approached, the crew of the Housatonic noticed a ripple in the water coming towards it. Enemy vessel off the port bow! Shit, it's below the water! I is that a whale? C can they train whales? Yark, that's no whale, sonny. That be a beast of nuts and iron. Fire the guns! Phil, you're from Columbus, Ohio. Why are you talking like that? Fire the guns, ye scallywag! Given the fact that submarines tend to operate below the waterline, the guns on board the Housatonic weren't able to lower far enough to fire at the Hunley, forcing the crew to fire away with their small arms to no avail. This plan is genius! Them Yanks can't even touch us! <laughs> you got that right, Cletus. You got that right. <laughs> Alright, boys, we're about to deliver the payload. In three, two, one. The torpedo made contact with the hole near the ammo storage, exploding on impact and sending massive amounts of debris in all directions. The Housatonic sank within five minutes and resulted in the deaths of only five of her crew. As for the HL Hunley, the crew was safe from the actual blast itself, but their close proximity to the payload meant that they faced the full force of the shockwave propagating through the vessel, which tends to not agree with your soft tissues, like your lungs or brain. So the entire crew of the HL Hunley died and it sank for the last time after a single mission. At the end of its service, it was able to rack up a grand total of 26 kills, only five of which were northerners. It is a bit disappointing that the slave-loving land of traitors gets to claim the world's first successful combat submarine, uh, but if it makes you feel any better, populating the high seas with over four times more rebel corpses than Union ones is about the most goddamn American thing you can do. And it would only be a year later that the Confederacy would decide to release their flag update 2.0. For the more than satisfactory war to really earn that promotion to World War status, it had to break out of the little European bubble it started off in. One potential area to expand the moderately stellar war was Africa, where they had already brought a little bit of Europe to in years prior with a wee bit of scrambling. However, because a lot of European control over Africa was superficial, they decided to keep the colonies neutral to avoid instability and the chance of getting overthrown by the local Africans. Ultimately, they agreed that the only thing more important than existential geopolitical conflict was ensuring white men on top. This new neutrality agreement was very important to the Europeans, lasting an entire week before they changed their minds. Tanga was the busiest seaport on the coast of German East Africa, a colony that snuggled up closely with British East Africa. The Germans are right there. Oh, this simply won't do. This will not do. This won't do at all, Charles. Right then, India, take care of these blokes. Um, uh, okay. Britain sent a request to the India office to attack the neighboring German colony, resulting in the dispatch of an expeditionary force 8,000 strong to the port town of Tanga. The Brits pulled up without a problem, and because the local Germans were such a puny and pathetic force, decided to enter the town peacefully to give them the chance to surrender. Alright bruv, gonna need you to lay down your guns. Ah, yes. Sorry man, I can't make that call. Gotta ask the Kaiser man first, you know. Ah, bosses, I get it. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I'll give you blokes uh, one hour to lower your flag over there. Uh, is that okay with you? Ja, ja, that, mm, that would be great. Perfect. Uh, by the way, we anchored a bit offshore. Are there any mines in the harbor?
Yes. They met up with a sneaky little German messenger who led the Brits to believe that the harbor was mined and pretended he had to get permission to surrender. This bought the Germans some valuable time to get reinforcements and prepare for an attack. After three hours, the Brits realized they just got bamboozled harder than if they'd pre-ordered a battlefield game, so they started to land their exhausted and seasick troops on the shoreline a few miles out of town. In an attempt to make up for some lost time, and because intel is for nerds, no reconnaissance was done beforehand as the clueless troops began their two-pronged attack on the town. Concealed German defenders quickly broke apart this advance, as bullets tend to do, resulting in lots of disorganized skirmishes. The northern prong was actually making some pretty good progress. Despite some minor hiccups, like getting shelled by their own ship and retreating officers getting shot by their colonels, they managed to make it all the way to the Customs House, where the Indian troops raised the British flag over the German colony on African soil. Their advance would be halted here, however, as they had to fall back to assist the southern prong, who weren't having as much luck. Those blokes were subjected to one of the new wonders of the war. Machine guns. These life-reducing devices tend to sting a little, so they halted the Indian troops advancing in the south, which is totally understandable. Imagine waltzing up to a tube on a hunky metal tripod, magically sending 500 metal bees at your face every minute. Uh, well, they didn't have to imagine that metaphor too hard, as they were also swarmed by hundreds of real bees every minute. Flustered by all the machine gun fire, massive swarms of bees descended on the British troops from the surrounding trees. Maybe the bees sought to prove that not even the MG-01 can compete with the misery that African wildlife is capable of, or perhaps it was just a desperate attempt to remedy a battlefield woefully underpopulated by bees. But either way, the Brits now had to deal with the war on two fronts. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like someone's a little lost. The Indian troops frantically popped off more lead in all directions than a Detroit suburb, firing blindly at Germans in the bushes and bees in the skies to no avail. Now that Mother Nature had established air superiority, the southern prong broke off into a full retreat. However, the Germans would be mistaken if they thought the little buzzing militia was their ally, for the bees did not believe in the magic of friendship. Only pain. So when the German troops entered the bees' territory, they too fell victim to nature's air force. In the end, the British would lose the battle despite drastically outnumbering the Germans, who they generously supplied with enough weapons and equipment to last them the rest of the slightly delightful war. The Brits took upwards of 800 casualties out of 8,000 troops, compared to under 150 German casualties of merely 1,000 defenders, making this one of the most embarrassing defeats of the above-average war. So at this point, I'm sure some of you are probably scratching your heads, wondering how little bee fiasco could be considered a wacky war tactic when their intervention was nothing more than random chance. An understandable but incorrect conclusion to make. To the untrained eye, it would seem like nothing but bad luck on the surface, but if you just look closely, you'd notice that this was clearly the work of none other than Dr. B. I try to avoid doing too many videos on war history, because, you know, the the death. But humans are curious creatures, naturally drawn towards the dark, mysterious cesspools of misery in the world. Exactly the stuff that you can find when studying the horrors of war or playing League of Legends. Luckily, you can always count on the shenanigans of Persians, bees, and or racists to help make overall grim topics a bit more digestible. Uh, but enough from me. What do you think, Life Lesson Leopard? Uh, hello? Hmm? Oh, hold on. My troops have just about finished decimating Missouri in Conflict of Nations World War III. You could speed up its destruction by clicking the link in the description. What a dumb state. It's the stupid arch, right? Really overrated arch. Thank you! W wacky War Tactics Part 2. Yeah, it's in stars. By the way, I know it's a long wait between uploads, just kind of the way things go, working a full-time job and making these videos on the side. But to help fill the gap between, you can subscribe to my second channel, cleverly named Red J, which I'll link in the description. And I also stream on Twitch from time to time, so feel free to swing on by. Again, link below. I might be streaming as this goes live, haven't really decided yet. Otherwise, I'll see all you lovely folks next time. Thanks for watching, and stay safe.